Once upon a time, the realm of video games was besieged by an endless hail of words from ivory tower snoots. People who saw games as mere entertainment, not art, the way films, books, and music were. Why they believed this was uncertain. Some say it was Diablo, Borderlands, and other loot fiestas too busy injecting dopamine directly into the player's eyeballs. Some say it was the constant, sometimes cyclical iteration, sequel over sequel. And some say it was the rise of the gotcha and live service game, turning players into payers. And there, there upon the hill, shining like the brazen sun, stood one studio, Team Eco. How could gamers ever brook this glaring offense? A game without guns, not even a drop of blood. A game made of puzzles. And worst of all, a game that amounts to an elevated escort quest. This is the gravest insult. Oh, it's amazing. Eco's a PS2 classic. You've seen it before, and in case you haven't, check out this box art. Because Americans are just too stupid to appreciate Italian painters. But that kid, he's got a stick. And there's a girl. Beast in red pill. God, I can't even joke about that. Eco's a game where you run around a castle with a white girl staving off shadowy entities and climbing thing. And. And climbing th Oh, son of a b- It was developed by Team Eco, a division of Japan Studio led by Fumito Ueda. Japan Studio funded a number of teams in the past, like Project Siren, who developed. Siren, and eventually Gravity Rush. Also, the team behind the original Gran Turismo was there, all a part of a broad push to fill out Sony's repertoire with lasting IPs. Unfortunately, Eco's sales were a little bit... <laughs> but that's okay. Critical acclaim matters until the money runs out, but it didn't. Team Eco kept making games, like three in 15 years. That's... People tend to pin its US flop on the box art and maybe... Maybe, but maybe Americans really are just too stupid to appreciate the funny hand-holding game. Solve the puzzles or join the tormented souls forever. <clears throat> Look at the penis font. The premise is easy. Kids born with horns and abandoned in an abandoned castle where he meets a girl. She doesn't speak the same language. Why is she talking bugs? The joy of Eco is simply simplicity. Wear them HUDs. Wear them HPs. Eco doesn't need a review. Do you need a review of this? Does it not self-explain? Was the US marketing guy right? Traveling between weathered locales, the player is drawn into the experience more deeply than something like, say, Nights in the Nightmare, for example, a great game, but playing at very different things. RPG elements, strategy, it's Bursting with menus, bars, and indicators. This is games for cats, bro. Why people like to point to Eco as the harbinger of games, games as, as art has a lot to do with presentation. It's not dripped up with the signs and signifiers of gaminess, yeah? Outside of blocky polygons and the occasional weird physics moment, no. Eco doesn't present much like a game at all. It shows the player a world in its totality, not cropped or contained with extraneous visual filler, and allows the player to wander in. Fumito Ueda was inspired by Prince of Persia, and you can see the influences. Hudless presentation is generally striking, but not always useful for the experience. In a more immediately threatening game, those elements might be considered mandatory by the director, but Ueda had a vision. Or in his words, design by subtraction. That means 2 minus 1 equals game design. Write that down, write that down! And I appreciate the vision. They knew they didn't need to hand you a health bar to serve up a fail state. The design sensibilities are, overall, successful. The removal of extraneous elements puts maximum focus on the relationship between the boy and the girl, Eco and Yorda respectively. You may have dedicated jump, attack, and interact buttons, but the bond is so important that Yorda gets her very own button. So if there's a problem you can't figure out in game, it's probably going to involve the Yorda button. Not that it works out all the time when you're learning. Oh, okay, if you wait it out, she figures it out. All right, fine, whatever. That creates friction sometimes. Bold as it is, stripping things to basics can jar the experience. Knowing where to go is never an issue. It's a fairly straight shot from start to finish, but sometimes you genuinely won't know what to do, even though you know the buttons, and you just sit, stunned like a moron until you put the pieces together 
and suddenly it makes sense after you felt like a dumbass for 20 minutes. It's the classic puzzle game problem. Too much uncertainty, too few hints can create all kinds of feels bads in something that's overall cute and inviting and scary. <laughs> Now, puzzle people find that strain enjoyable, and really, once you get it, you'll never sweat it again, but I will remember how I couldn't solve a puzzle for actual children. <laughs> you know, I never was in the gifted class. Not all friction is bad. Eco ratchets up the tension every few screens by forcing the player away from Yorda. She can only do so much and can't access all the areas Eco can by himself. So, you go. Problem is, if you leave her alone, I mean... <laughs> And not all the time, but it happens, especially if you abandon her a couple screens out. So, you know, grab a staple gun and here we go! Eco combat is real and it can't hurt you. But you can die! I cheated a little saying Eco has no health bar. That's accurate, there is no bar, but you can die a couple ways. For example, leaping to your death. Now, that makes sense, but you won't lose health points in combat. In this kid's case, you know, like kids are, you're either dead or you're fine. Oh my God. Shadowy goons going berserk isn't the problem. It's letting Yorta get kidnapped while you're flat on your ass. Because if she goes, you go. However, I am a video game master who studied the game while you studied your cringe 9 to 5, so I figured out I could time repeating the first swing in a combo to stunlock any enemy to death. It keeps you moving forward out of back attack range and only takes a little timing. Ueda may have tried to remove the gaminess from his game, but I'll keep it a buck. Nah. Bullshit. Complete bullshit. Sometimes you're forced into playing honest and fighting to the death. The devs only really hand you a crappy combo and you're punished pretty severely for getting hit. A long recovery period that'll give you barely enough time to pull Yorda out of danger. But mercifully, in the few instances you're made to backtrack, you're free to run away. Bullshit. And all throughout the runtime, facing challenges, slaying shadows, you're deepening your bond with Yorda. Not mechanically per se, she doesn't evolve meaningfully or gain new powers or anything, but you still grow together. External to the game, you get more confident with that window you have to save her before she gets sucked down the portal. You learn the ins and outs of her AI, what makes her tick, that she's capable of things you weren't even aware of. Wow, really? I didn't think she could make it. And another dev might not have done that. They might have divvied up new power unlocks level over level, like letting Yorda use magic to push you or lift you or something, and setting aside the technical frustrations inherent to that potentiality. I don't think the game would even work like that. It would have demonstrated mechanical growth, yes, but not fostered that holistic understanding of the person, not put it front and center the way it is, absent any mechanical obfuscation. So, game good. One fun quirk of Eco involves version differences. Both Shadow of the Colossus and Eco were carried over in a collection for the PS3 and both differ slightly from their original incarnations. Take this waterway segment in Eco. It's a simple puzzle that requires climbing and interacting with a set piece, but the PS3 version adds new assets to the area. People talk up and down about version differences, but regardless of the minutia, the core remains the same. Eco is Eco. Get it any way you can. <laughs> what? What is Eco? Is it drugs? Where am I going with this? The actual actions you take might deserve a bit of a look. You don't engage with anything particularly weird, but you do have to get a grip on climbing and swinging controls alongside typical box pulling and pushing. These don't really need much explanation, unless you're like four years old, but there's one point in the game where you're expected to push a bridge down with the momentum from swinging on a rope, and it happens so late in the game. I was flabbergasted when, being frustrated with seemingly hitting a wall, I swung on the rope and it worked. Most of the game relies on its buttons, not contextual, in-universe contact with specific objects. It was so weird, but so obvious. Like, surely they can't expect you to- oh. And that's the beauty of the design. Even when, in terms of the game's physics, Eco isn't physically banging into the bridge and knocking it down, it's just a cutscene triggered by the swing, but it anticipates that you'll intuit the solution anyway. 
A similar moment happens later when you push a crate into water and have to drag it through. You never combined those two skills previously, but finding out you can feels so good. A natural extension of the mechanics built from the preceding experience. So let's dig into the quest proper. The story is minimalistic, and it's refreshing coming off something like the Xeno games that are much more interested in text, premises, lore, and reveals. This, in conjunction with the play, is the true reason Eco gets the coveted art label from people outside games coverage. It does so much with almost nothing. It isn't indulgent, it simply feels like artisanship. Some people need swords, guns, magic, gods, and 10,000 years of history to tell a compelling story. And some people just need the junk in their pocket. You meet Yorta, traipse around the castle grounds, and eventually you're confronted by this person? Good heavens, how frightening. Please don't step on me. I would hate that so much. She tells you to leave and then leaves, so... I mean, thanks so much for helping. Can't even cross the bridge yet, dumbass, your gate is closed. A second round of traipsing gets us an open door and a finished bridge, so we can leave, finally. Hmm. On our way out, we're thwarted by arcing magic, presumably channeled by the queen herself. The bridge begins to pull away again, and we're separated. In this electric moment, you're left to control your character freely, so you do exactly what you know you have to do jump to Yorda, who, for the first time since the quest began, reaches out and grabs your hand, saving your life. It hits hard for very kinetic reasons, you know, both these kids have very bruised organs. If she acted like she had up until this point, we'd be jumping for the ledge, not Yorda. But after learning to trust Eko and developing a genuine connection, she acts autonomously. We're separated again, find a really big sword, and set out to do exactly what you'd expect. Fumble around like a dumbass while the queen knocks the sword out of our hands, threatening instant death if we make a single input error. Oh! 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 A lot is left up to interpretation, but one thing is certain. Yorda was intended to become the queen's vessel, and in the conclusion, seemingly does, but also carries the fallen Eco out of the crumbling castle and sets him free. Ueda isn't direct in his storytelling methods, preferring to leave things open to interpretation, to some degree. His words. Like a play, the characters may exist on the page, but live and die as they enter and exit the stage. Eco has no fully-fledged extended universe. No, where are they now? But I like to think that the game ends hopefully, if only to say, all that work was worth something. Man, talking about the community is so funny. What if there were... 17 Colossi. Guys, think bigger. Shadow <laughs> of the Colossus, aka Sot, a game so beloved, so thoroughly covered. Why, I don't have to do anything. The review's all done. Ah! Eco was great. Connecting with women, climbing windmills and things. How could you possibly top that? Right, give the player a sword and make them plunge it into gigantic beasts while your PS2 begs for death. I played it twice, the PS3 version and the 2018 remake. People complain about the PS3 version's frame rate allegedly increasing the difficulty, but it's already not a very difficult game, so... And like, the real problem is... If you haven't played it, are you even gamer? Turn in your gamer card, please? It's an all-timer, but not for nothing, okay? The game earns that title beat by beat, stab by bloody stab. It just works. That said, just working was never enough, or else we'd all be playing Grey Block Fighter Championship. So what's up? You play as Wander, a fairly nondescript kid who rides into the cursed land on a mission. He places this dead girl on a pedestal, and a voice from above strikes a deal with him. Slay the 16 guardians that roam the land, and she'll be brought back to life, but at a terrible price. Well, I see nothing wrong with those arrangements. Striking out from the temple into the open world, we're treated to a visual feast of stark skies contrasted by sweeping rocky plains, beautiful in their austerity. The remains of civilization's past dot the landscape, and scarce trees stand defiantly against the wind. It's not a lot to play with, honestly, but that isn't the point. This is Ueda's world, okay? Designed by subtraction. Who needs people? Who needs homes? Who needs most flora and fauna even? Why am I wandering through nothing? 
Is this a visual metaphor for the meaninglessness of Wander's quest? Nah, that's stupid. So the focus is on the loop. Find a Colossus, put it down, return to base, repeat. You don't need a world to get lost in. Team Eco just needs a world to contain the Colossi. It could have been stage-based, or just put you in the boss room if it really wanted minimalism, like... <laughs> But the physical space creates some dead air between killings, lets the player simmer in the setting and reflect on past battles, wonder about new ones, you know, insert themselves the way Eco developed genuine player bonds by not turning Yorda into a soulless mechanic repository. And if you really want, you can hunt down skinks and fruits to increase your health and stamina, but even those scant upgrades aren't necessary. The remake added its own brand of collectible to get players into the world gold coins. Even being near one makes the controller wake everyone in your house up at 3 a.m. Oh my god. But you need all 79 to unlock a sword, so this is not a game about special swords, bro. Thus, you wander, go astray, and if you're ever lost, just whip out your sword and raise it high. The light beams will point the way. The remake changed things up a bit. You'll notice a greater depth and breadth in both construction and color. It's just more of the original game, less washed out, but still visually stony. I don't think it alters the experience enough to discuss. Most of the functional play is wrapped up in the Colossi. <laughs> How do you explain all 16 Colossi without turning your video into a boss guide? Well, there's one way. Ooh, Lord, I feel something in my bones. Colossus number one, blink and then it's done. Colossus number two, oh uh, literally who? Colossus number three, dodge and then he's free. Colossus number four, basically a chore. Colossus number five, clinger take a dive. Colossus number six, where is his dick? Colossus number seven, drown and go to heaven. Colossus number eight, can a brother relate? Colossus number nine, what a waste of time. Colossus number 10, off, oh, off, oh, oh. Colossus 11, no seriously, why the oh, Colossus number 12, this is ridiculous. Colossus 13, the climb is obscene. Colossus 14, hey nice bork day, I the 15th boy, climb and then destroy, and the final boss. None of these need a review. They need to be experienced, man. Back! Back, you f mongrel! Part of the title's success came from its singleness. No other game is Shadow of the Colossus. Eco was great, but Slot ah! spoke to people who were buying and playing video games. It's you, your sword, and your horse. Get killing, bro. Hunting each enemy, climbing each colossus to find its weak points, clinging for survival as it shakes its massive head is a wholly kinetic experience you cannot grasp just by watching gameplay. It's the interactive medium. It's to be interacted with, to be understood completely. And unlike various games that eschew the potential of genuine kinetic elements, Shadow of the Colossus made them core to the play. It was the perfect game at the perfect time. Irrefutable proof that mechanics meant something. Buttons weren't just for pounding. That clinging for dear life by depressing that trigger was, in fact, cool fun and art. And only those who done could know. How could you know if you never played? It's such a satisfying experience, too. A short jog into a boss room and a battle against a hulking beast. I wouldn't call them terrifying at all. If anything, the eyes are uncanny at first, but docile on inspection. Whenever you aren't pointing them with arrows, sending them into a rage. That will require a tetanus shot. But their size, heft, and power are obvious. You're a mosquito to these things. Channel that energy. No, not like that. It's especially felt with the ones that don't necessarily try to resist you, but use their own power, ripping through the wind and water in a bid to knock you off. I've said it before, but there truly is nothing like it. Instead of bothering with complex and skill-dependent dodge rolling like any other action title, even from the same period, you're simply made to persist to find victory. That said, every fight is different, and some are significantly more obnoxious than others. Colossus number 11 is particularly bad, and 14 as well on that note, for being able to stunlock the player. Especially if you're a generally incompetent nitwit who didn't realize you could mash out of stun and had to record over your lines in post. Even staying on certain colossi feels much more AI dependent than anything. Again with 11 here, I couldn't get a stab in edgewise. 
clap until I remounted, and that second round, it was like I stunlocked him. I don't get it. Maybe they're built to screw with the player early so it doesn't end too soon. Maybe I found the right position to cling from. Who knows? That's the trick. They're never really miserable, just a little opaque. And I suppose that's fitting for a minimally challenging game. I like the different variations of Colossi. They're hard to cleanly categorize, but there's a distinct difference in vibe fighting the smaller, scrappier ones versus the big clumsy giants or the plotting animalian ones. I appreciate a little variation in my 16-course meal. The smaller ones need to be upended, usually by exploiting their bad habits. Showing Tum Tum, what a whore. Really, all of them boil down to exploiting a habit, like level one monster hunter, I guess. A bird needs to be baited into swooping at you. Popping some pustules makes the desert worm thing drop his wings. This monolithic chunk gets baited easily into geysers. Several of them struggle to maintain eye contact because they're so big. And I could sit here like the average gaming YouTuber with such lines as, each one is so unique, it makes the game a joy to experience. But the truth is, some are easy, some suck huh. and some are really interesting because they do something unexpected or make you feel smart. Fun play overall, I rate number out of number Following through with Ueda's design by subtraction bit, Shadow of the Colossus is unique among the Team Eco games for actually featuring a health bar and the stamina bar. Two <laughs> bars! Both related to combat, that's why. Naturally, if the game is about climbing colossi, it's got to be gamified somehow. If the colossi are meant to pose a threat, or combat is intended to matter, their attacks have to be threatening. Health and stamina bars. But where, pray tell, is the bar indicating how angry and driven Wander is? Bro, you're not looking so good. Sneakily, rubbing their hands together like Dastardly Dan or some shit. Yeah. Team Eco makes Wander degrade visually over time, or specifically, the more colossi are slain. It's not hard to know that what you're doing is wrong. You're taking orders from a voice that's presented as knowledgeable, trustworthy, literally coming from where you'd expect God to deliver lines, and yet he asks you to kill guardians, says the price will be terrible, makes you slaughter otherwise innocent beings harmlessly roaming the barrens, and when they die, light streaks up and pokes holes in the sky itself. That can't be good! <laughs> These creatures are majestic, grandiose, they're animals, dude. They're wonderful and mysterious, not deserving of murder. And when you do, not only does a sad track play, but you're immediately skewered by black tendrils and warped back to the temple surrounded by increasing numbers of shadowy men. Imagine playing Eco and then playing this. I'm making more of the things that harassed me all game appear and I'm being a useful idiot for the magical entity in the sky? What am I stupid? Cap it all off with the protagonist turning into a f leper. And it should be obvious that the quest is foul. It's so foul, aggro f dies. Splish. Yeah, I'm probably going to hell for that one. It's so foul, rain immediately starts to fall in the remake. Yeah, nice pathetic fallacy, jack off. Oh, a tower colossus, huh? The tower arcana of the tarot, upright position, sudden change, upheaval, chaos, revelation, awakening. I think I'm in f <laughs> danger. The final Colossus is hard to argue with. In a sense, it's perfect. A new challenge involving an obstacle course of sorts from approach to the earth underfoot. A massive climb as the once terrifying tower is stuck immobile in its shackles and only vulnerable by provocation and timed leaps. It's genuinely frustrating in the remake. That is, it takes a lot longer to grasp the necessary cling strategy than the other fights, mostly because the thing has ADHD and won't stop fidgeting fuck. But eventually you make it to the weak point and finish the quest at the highest spot in the game. You can be an idiot, but try not to be a useful idiot. With all of the guardians and their statues destroyed, Dorman is free from his seal and rushes into his vessel. You 
groomed for the role as their spirit was slowly degraded, killing the Colossi. Villagers rush to the scene just in time to watch your transformation, and you're made to flail away at their puny forms, finally put into the meandering shoes and towering perspective of the beasts you've been killing. Unable to strike the villagers down, but critically still in control. Dorman resides within you, the player is effectively given Dorman's gameplay, but the player is still part wander. You have to appreciate the subtle beauty in game design, how it tells stories with mechanics. Awesome, you think. Wander is still alive. There might be some hope. I can feel it. Wait, I can do this. I still have control. I can still win. Why isn't it stopping? This has to be one of the endings of all time. The hero dies. The villain is effectively contained, but I guess honors his contract because the girl wakes up. She finds a baby who can be controlled with different buttons to cry different, and Agro lives. I'm not sure what I meant to think. It might have been more disquieting to simply end after Wander's ceiling, or to have the girl rise with nothing else but barren land in sight. As it stands, Wander's been reborn and the emotional pull earlier is erased. Agro wasn't a sacrificial horse. He's fine. It reminds me a lot of Eco's ending. It probably would have been better served if the kid made it to the mainland alone, an outcast having exited the magic world and returning changed. But instead, it follows him, and they go, hand in hand. I guess Ueda loves hope, loves possibility in the future, and finds it more rewarding for an audience than hitting the perfect tragic note. Maybe it's a uniquely video game's compulsion. Hey, come on, we gotta go. We gotta go, <laughs> we gotta go save the world. <laughs> come on, man, can't just get up, please. You don't care? You don't care if the world explodes? Uh-oh, what's this frame rate? Video games are dead. The Last Guardian, a tale of two vibes. On one hand, on the other, Mice! Mice, you fool! Mongo! The Last Guardian really is a tragedy of development. The actual product here is a resounding success. It's executed brilliantly, somehow managing perfect artistic coherence with the preceding titles, and still finding a way to present something entirely new and beautiful. It's amazing, a technical marvel, but it's short and hyperlinear despite whatever relative freedom the gameplay implies, and it's mechanically confusing in a way the other games weren't. Now it accounts for these shortcomings, there's a reason for everything, I promise, but it's a pretty hard sell when development started in 2007 and the studio proceeded to kick the can up the boulevard for nearly a decade. Look at this original trailer. Damn, bro looking like Caillou from the Philippines. The game also carried a critical weakness the others lacked, being spawned exactly in the shippy most trash garbage period of YouTube, 2016. Mere years before the game's critique renaissance you see the fruit of today. Like I mentioned, it's got some mechanical quirks. What did YouTubers do with those quirks? And that isn't helped by the way the slightest touch of the stick makes the main character yeah. sprint in the given direction, waving their arms. First, I want to talk about the controls. Not only because they're 80% of what brings the game down, every tiny aspect of the control scheme is somewhat off. We have Jump clip. over the bridge. No. Bridge. Jump over the Eat bridge. And nope. This is the complete opposite way. This way. Well, this is the where the bridge is. Hey, editor Kbash here. These aren't meant to be dunks. I'm not trying to insult these other creators. This was six years ago. God knows half my catalog from four years ago and below is worse. I'm just trying to set the tone for how people reacted to this game. It's not that they're completely off base, but imagine you're one of the few studios so esteemed that whatever you make, though you've produced very little in some, is labeled true art. Even if games are art and it's not a question, you skipped the battle and won the war. 
Imagine you're the people behind Eco, the game that landed in a thousand developers' top 10 games of all time, the face that launched a thousand ships. Imagine you're the people behind Shadow of the Colossus, one of the single most respected and mythologized video games ever. Period. But things go bad during development. It's slower than expected. The concept isn't coming to fruition as easily as it should. You can't even get the thing done on PS3 because you want another tech upgrade to truly realize the vision. Sony even pulls in Santa Monica Studio folks, the God of War people, and others to review your code and get things back on track. After all this wasted time, for what was set to be a short dev cycle, you, Ueda, leave the company and consider your future. Eventually, you provide support, along with other disparate members of the team, to finish the job. And then your game comes out, sells fine, gets dragged up and down YouTube, compared relentlessly and unfairly to the previous games, not considered on its own merit, treated like a total failure by capital G gamers, and, mercifully, a plucky artistic success by outlets, the people who gamers wish would die, and the thing doesn't even run well on base PS4, the system it was developed for, and gamers for some reason can't figure out the controls for actual infants. And that's why it's so hard to talk about. I commiserate with plenty of the criticism. I think it's rough around the edges beyond just the performance issues and for personal enjoyment, somewhere around or below eco. In solving one of the most frustrating aspects of puzzle-based game design, it manages to create entirely new ones. New, new vectors, vectors in annoyance! But treating Ueda and his team like hacks when they're some of the only people who utterly bucked all gaming trend bullshit from games as service to RPG system creep to even attempting playing towards a mainstream gaming audience more focused on blood and combat. It's sick. It's disgusting. Put some goddamn respect on that name or keep it the f out of your mouth for real. The Last Guardian is the story of a boy and an animal. This animal. Sure, he's fine. It's the simplest story to date. Nothing about kids growing horns or magical sky people quests. Okay, here, a boy is lost and needs to find his way home, preferably with some brain cells. He manages to befriend a beast, Trico, mostly with food, and they search for a way out of the very deep and enclosed gorge they're trapped in. Yo, tail ladder. That is the strongest part of the experience, working alongside this fully realized creature to actively solve puzzles or to remove the language of video games from the equation, advance, and through teamwork, is surprisingly rewarding. Team Eco proved they could do this with their very first game, but Trico here takes advantage of modern advances to do things I can only describe as mind-bending. For years, games attempted to capture even vague realism, wayward a pursuit as it often is. Trico may be a fictional beast, but it's easy to believe in the fiction during play. It's the ruffled fur, the hybrid animal features, taking time to jangle a dangling chain or scratch behind its ears. Trico is a living, breathing creature. And many games don't give animals that much weight. Beasts tend to be smaller, less center stage, or in the case of Monster Hunter, well-realized and uniquely so in the medium, but they also happen to be moveset dispensaries, cycling through their available options like any other boss enemy. Monsters in Monster Hunter are video games. Trico isn't cast in that context. He's allowed to be a creature. The animation budget is free to softly settle on his hide. Look, he's scared to go in the water. Oh, I love him. But the controls, ooh, the controls. I have no idea what people are complaining about regarding controls. Kid plays fine, just like, just use them. They feel like they were designed to emulate the protagonist, okay? A roly-poly kid. This isn't Devil May Cry. You don't need to turn on a dime and land a combo. You're mostly running, jumping, and climbing like kids do. It's very easy to handle. The most difficult thing is climbing on Trico to calm him down when he's riled up. That's it. And it incorporates those Shadow of the Colossus mechanics beautifully. Everything else is contextually difficult, not mechanically so. In fact, that's my biggest issue with the game. The Last Guardian will let you feel stupid, much like Eco, but unlike Eco, you've got a friend who does things, pokes around, wanders. Tell me your cat doesn't get into sh I don't buy it! Wow. You're a brat. Trico will point you in the direction you need to go if you simply 
allow him to. But the game doesn't assume you want your hand held and gives you time to dig through rooms yourself, searching for possible solutions to whatever problem. This is awesome because it means the flow is never truly squelched. You can maintain some momentum no matter how terrible you are at recognizing context clues and navigating 3D space. That said, most puzzle games struggle with one simple thing. A puzzle is an equation whose pieces or variables are scattered, rearranged, whatever. This is why Golden Suns are so simple and so smooth. Very little friction occurs because the pieces tend to be laid out, plain, and, and left to be interacted with between one or two screens max, generally speaking children can put them together. The Last Guardian is a modern puzzle game that takes place in very vertical 3D environments. Sometimes you end up looking around for a solution, giving up, climbing on Trico, and he just leaps out of the area into the next one. And you didn't know that. You didn't know how far or how high he could jump. There's no stat associated with his jump height. You didn't know if he knew where to go, what he's fully capable of. You get a better sense with time, but it's some time before things click together. For context, I did the second half of the game in three very brisk two hour recording sessions, energized and active because the initial first half was spent fumbling around like a dumbass trying to wrap my head around the experience. Maybe unintentionally, The Last Guardian requires a level of abstract thinking heretofore unseen in the Team Eco games. Trico will wander where he shouldn't, never anywhere silly, just wrong places that lead you to think they're the forward path. He can aid in unintended misdirection, because he so often does point you in the correct direction. Other times, Trico is uncooperative. He does listen to prompts for the most part. I only had one or two moments where he wouldn't do what he was supposed to until I changed how I went about commanding him, but that doesn't erase the clunk in trying to get a 10-ton beast to engage in puzzle solving. Then again, that is literally the experience you signed up for. Sometimes the game manages to trick you into attempting bad solutions. Here, look. You have to feed Trico pretty regularly, but these moments aren't on a timer. The game just puts a Trico feeding segment in to let you breathe, a little lull in the action. Okay, cool. So there's a barrel of something, it doesn't really show, down in the rubble here. You're made to drag it up out of the hole, and it's harder than it looks, by the way. I am not long for this world. And then you're free to walk it back, only the track is broken and you don't want to do all that again, so instead of trying to walk along the broken track, unsure of your footfalls, you try throwing it over, which is impossible as far as I can tell. You are, in fact, meant to walk over carefully, but it's easy to get either tricked or defeated by frequent misdirections and frustrations. It's not even bad or offensive, it just jarred with my expectations. Trico's afraid of mirrors with eyes. I actually don't think I know why even after beating the game. Pretty satisfying to shatter though. I love breaking sh- yeah. Not all play involves partnership. Sometimes you gotta leave the thing hanging, literally, while you complete some task, find some path or switch or something. Most of the run is just that, you or the duo finding your way through some ruins, but it feels like more was planned at a point. Very early you find a mirror that lets you focus light at any given spot, and Trico reacts to the light, involuntarily streaking lightning from his tail toward the point of interest. This gets used to solve a few puzzles, knocking wood and debris away, that sort of thing. But the game takes it away from you within the hour and hands it back near the end. It's very bizarre, but in retrospect makes sense. If the game was just acquiring new powers for Trico, he'd become that vision of Yorda I described, someone who mechanically advanced level over level via parceled upgrades, and lacking those, you instead grow holistically, once again, by coming to understand the mechanics, developing a deeper, more confident bond with Trico, and occasionally being shown a new trick. Like this oh, moment! You have one job! You have one job! Yes! Yes! Oh man, and that's a killer cool. moment for this kind of game. A certain tension underpins the relationship. Really early, you're shown a vision of Trico eating the boy, which makes you assume it'll happen eventually. And instead, Trico does that very motion to save your life. No big deal. Down at 100. You missed! You idiot! I'm gonna die! Oh! Oh! Wait, 
this game actually kind of is good. Combat is actually part of the play, but remember, this is designed by subtraction. You have no health bar, and your only fail states are falling off of a cliff. <laughs> or getting dragged away into a door. Like a uh, way to pull an Uno reverse and turned you into Yorda, but player character Yorda. Because the mechanics under this framework must exist to highlight the core conceit, the bond between Trico and the boy, you're made to support Trico rather than carrying combat. I've never really played a game like this and found it really enjoyable, taking a back seat in this mode of play that normally I'd be fishing around in for the best, most degenerate scumbag option like Eco's light attack spam. You're still made to bowl over enemies holding fear-inducing mirrors, yank spears out of Trico's body and calm him down after battle. He really doesn't take conflict very well at all. Jesus Christ, calm down, dude, you're making a scene. <laughs> the story doesn't evolve much, but the goal remains the same. Climb to the top of a particular tower that Trico's constantly yowling at. You'll run into a couple other Tricos who mostly want you dead, except they're all masked, so presumably they're being controlled and not inherently evil or something stupid. I appreciate that. I don't really enjoy killing animals in games at all. I find it both less fun and interesting than, well, any kind of person murder, and I don't really care to pry into why that is. Not once has he lost a sword fight. Got it. People are funnier. This culminates in a marathon of a final sequence involving a brutal battle against a horde of statues, climbing the tower from within, doing a protracted solo sequence, coming face to face with the apparent master of these ruins, a black goop. Okay. And... Hey, stop! Stop with the fuck! The Last Guardian was a lot to experience, mostly because for every good feeling, something's there to reel it back in. You naturally run to defend Trico and fail, get knocked around, pull a tail, it doesn't matter. You're useless, but you're meant to advance by wandering over to the mirror that they kicked away from you to fight back with your only means of doing so. <laughs> only, they won't let you. Every time you go to pick it up, you trigger a cutscene where you cling to one of the beasts for survival, which leads to his tail being torn and thrown away. You have the mirror, so you find the tail and... Wait a minute, if the children are swallowed whole by the guardians and deposited here, barrels come out. We've been feeding Trico children. <laughs> what the fuck? The Last Guardian isn't complicated. Black orbs, magic mirrors, and animate statues notwithstanding, they're relics from another era you stumbled across and managed to leave behind. The story happened between Trico and the boy. After giving his absolute everything for the beast, at least as much as someone can expect from a child, the beast returns it with interest, taking an otherworldly beating and flying the kid home. Not everyone is going to have a meaningful relationship with an animal in their lifetimes, I realize. I remember feeling genuine frustration at the end of the run, but mostly because I was tired and grinding out the game, and frankly, I was getting annoyed by little contextual things not making immediate sense in my tired state. Looking back on the experience, The Last Guardian does much more than Eco and Shadow of the Colossus to truly make you helpless. Trico hasn't just been your support, he's been your carry. A total reversal of what happens in Eco, where you pick up the sword with intent to rescue Yorda, and also pulling away from what Shadow of the Colossus did. Regardless of Agro's sacrifice, you still had your sword, your bow, and a Colossus to slay. You were still given the chance to grab your destiny. The Last Guardian is much more devastating by comparison. And the reward for all of this is the dissolution of the relationship. It's the kind of emotional punch you can only really feel the full weight of having agonized through about five to eight hours of play. Watching Trico be treated understandably badly by the villagers tears your heart out because for as incredible as it was to see something true and beautiful grow between these beings born of disparate worlds, you know it can't last. Sometimes it's hard wrapping these things together, but honestly, the Team Eco games are so similar, 
so clearly building from one another that it's impossible to mistake their value. These games tell stories, but more importantly, they tell stories within the medium, with the medium, with buttons, context, and interaction, and in the absence of the excesses and indulgences of so many text and cutscene laden games. That doesn't make the stories better or whatever. I'm not here to power scale Team Eco and Monolith Soft or Square Enix or whatever, but stripped of everything, save bones, we see how video games can celebrate their idiosyncrasies. You could put a best-selling book in a game, but it wouldn't be more enjoyable inherently. If you put a proper, full-length novel on a shelf in Skyrim, it might simply be less accessible and more frustrating to read than, say, buying the book in person. And with games, developers have access to tools and functions whole languages other mediums don't. That's where the great video game stories will be told, where the medium is the message, where content dictates form expressed through a medium-specific language. Every Team Eco game is an unmistakable triumph in that sense. The bond with Yorda and the arc it follows, the physicality of the Shadow of the Colossus, where the challenges and implications of the journey are baked into the heft of the mechanics, and The Last Guardian's palpable warmth as the player steps back from active combatant role into the caretaker space. And more than that, Team Eco's games are the fruit of incredibly concise visions. They are, in all ways, the beauty of the medium. Well anyway, there's not nearly enough blood, guns, and loot. 7 out of 10! Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Acropolis, Alpha, 42, All Snaps, Andrew, Redacted, Arch, Arswasser, Azura, Axin A, Audra, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bosch 7, Bear Keeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Beguile, Big Papa Sprung, Bing Bing Doo Doo Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Borgle Hargle, Boha, Boom Dead, BH Operator, Born in Shadow, Brandon S, Brandon Hesse, Brios, British Gooch, Cal, Pixar, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wade, Z-Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Hero Hero, Cordon, Chris Bromo, CLB5000, Cody Golden, Comfy Moogle, Couch Moba, Crash Girls, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glassworks, Cynical, Daddy Dago, Don Dio, Danny Pango, Dakota Storm Daggy Jones, Stag, Swaggy David Man, Castillo, Dara, Decode, Deadwood, Dead, Dennis Amaya, The Strega, Diablo, Dingus Bat, Doug Prince, DJ, Professor K, Dr. Cullen, PhD, The Protagonist, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Thug, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Emperor Pickle, Empty Tenshi, Eric Monticello, Aesthetico, Everstone, Stone Isle, Gnar, Fail Knight, Forte Noir, Super Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Frog Vormis, Gato Nero, Glyph Seeker, Nine Cat, Dobo Bobo, Goose 6112, Great. The Darkest Black, Gar Gucci Plant, Asi Ibrahim Tanirga, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Arkosh, Demon, Game and Station, Hermit J, Hex Max, Honey Mutt, Horn Tiger, How do you know? Huey, I just took seven grams of magic mushrooms and now I'm lost in the woods. I'm supporting K Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer. Ingenious Club. I O B G. I punched a sandwich. Irrational. Irradiated cherry. Dice Kyle. It's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jack Hydra. Jacob. James. Jason Lash. Jaden. J L Savarus. J Day. J K Hedgehog. John Bo the Joker. Joke Frog. Jordan Joyner. Jorzy Burden. Juicy Frost. Jules D L C. Julian My Julian. Kai's at a slow. K Bash's best K. Keegan Too Cool. Keith the Thief. Kata Snap. King Kuma. Keith. Can I pipe? Clock. K Noe. Cone Twenty Twenty. Crazy. Crazy. Dark Chocolate. Kuma. Kais, Kyle, KZ Excellent, Lady Dentalia, Lady Weed, Blatrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Lethal Nibbles, Little Big Trouble, Loathsome Dung Eater, Warren, Low Fat Mogul, Lucas Boyd, Lucky McSmucky, Mac James, Lunatic, Loopin' the Turd, Magic Meow, Magical Mad Man, Mama Rollin', Metapool, Mara Ganger, Hercules, Mugio, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Meeple Puppet, Metal Gear Gash, Michelle Citrano, Mike DeVere, Mickey Moe Official, Mikusagi, Moa, Bobby Dobby, Big Titty Gok, GF Cooley, Monochrome Only, Morgana Black, Modi, Mr. 
the Tonga. Mr. Whiskey 282. Mr. Yeedy Dabface McYoink Ball. Nyra New. Nito Torpedo. Nico Puzzle Rack. Nifty Rex. Norian Daridius. Not Nobel. Nuggy. Old Burgle. Old Man Cranberry. Omega Fighter. Omni Nerd Zero. Only LK. The Plant. PBK. Pandemic Cowboy. Pelagic Undulation. PK Gaming. Mike. Pop your fur Hitman. Potato Gaming HD. Prismatic Dan. Probably not Grady. Fractal and Pals. Project Darklight. Punch Fighter Champion. Quasar McDougal. Quillworth. Quinn. Rad Punk. Raging Atarexia. Reggie Rodriguez. Renteca Bond. Ricochet Friend Relay. Ray Londo. RP Gamer. Ryan Mattel. Ryan Mori Brooks. Psycon Man. Siren Smells Good. Salsa. Salty Smash. Scribe Slendy. Say Say. Sakai No Awarda. Sephirium. Sexy Bionicle GS. Shinigami. Shintendo. Shut Up Wesley. Silver Bear 909. Singe. Sir Doodles a lot. Sim. God! Sleepy Wabbit. Snars. Sozetta Den. Sockum Bopper. Suckdologer. Space Lizard. Squidget. Squishward. Star Knight Sky. Storm Strider and the House of Storm. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Dingus. Super Sandwich Guy. Shorn Chubbington. Terrence Swift. The Big Bubby. The Clown Prince of Cringe. The Digital Dutchman. The Good Lord has blessed me. Hallelujah! The Green Loki. The Crispy Boy. The Peacemaker Pyro. The Salt Knight. The Nomad. The Real McCoy. Dick, Dick Misty. Fresh. Rips Heart Tickles McGuffin. Tim Lobster. Timid the Writer, Tony Jones, The Legend, Total Play, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, Vig, Vacant Plaza, Valen Rift, Venom, Vice Pop, Vic, Waposa, Weed Trash, wow, Wayland, Where Am I Help, Widgy, Winter Solstice, Wind TV, Renshin, Zanny Tanner, Yero 12, Yashi Chi, Yekunda, Your Mom, Winky Face, Zachary Lives, Zachary Z, Zanasso, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zed Slayer Gamer, Zero Zalazar, Silvlin Ray, Z-Nova, Cyberpunk, if you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash